Praise the Lord, everybody. Stand up on your feet this morning. Let's get ready to praise the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Did anybody come in here ready to worship this morning? I shouldn't have to pump you up, prime you up, tell you to do something, but we should come in here every morning expecting God to do something great in our midst, expecting Him to save somebody, expecting Him to heal somebody, expecting Him to deliver somebody. This altar is always open. It doesn't matter what point of the service it is, but you can come down here and you can get exactly what you need. Because he can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ask, or even imagine according to the... Let's welcome the Spirit of God. Father, we thank you. God, we ask you to just move into our midst right now. God, that you would just do your perfect will in this house. If somebody needs to be saved, God, I pray that you would draw If somebody needs to be healed, God, I pray that you would reach out your hand and touch them. There's... To your will, oh God. According to your will right now. We expect it today. We came in with expectation that you can do the impossible. That you can move the unmovable. Oh God, I ask you to do it right now. And we'll give you praise and honor and glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.
How many of y'all know that's the reason why we're living? To see Jesus. To see Jesus. Hallelujah. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We're going to continue our worship and our tithes and our offerings. Hallelujah. Again, just so grateful. Week in and week out, God gives us the opportunity to give back to Him. Just small measure of what He gives to us in such abundance. But He's so faithful. And if you don't have any cash on you, that's all right. We'll bring up the slide on the screen that shows, amen, where you could give electronically, whether it's GiveLify or Cash App, amen. We, we let people be able to give however they can give to the Lord. And we know that we are living in a new, a new generation and a new day, and uh, so we want to help everybody to be able to do that. In fact, uh, we were holding a youth conference here not long ago, and a bunch of the young people came up and said, Pastor Jared, none of us carry cash anymore. Like, we don't carry cash. We use Cash App and uh, Venmo and whatever else they use. And so I said, well, I better get on top of that. I don't want to rob you from your ability to give, so... Today, this morning, we have an awesome opportunity to worship God with our tithes and our offerings. Everything that helps the work of God move forward. So if you would, let's just go before the Lord in prayer. And then the brothers will come and receive your offering. Father, we thank you so much for this great honor and opportunity we have to give. Our hearts, Lord, are indicting a good matter. Our tongue is as the pen of a ready writer to declare the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living God to declare, Lord, your mercies and your grace among us. And, Lord, to be able to come after you blessed us with employment, God, if you blessed us with salaries and paychecks, Lord, we come to give back to you just in small portion of what you have given to us in such abundance. Now, Lord, use it for your glory. Help us to use it as good stewards of the manifold grace of God, to disseminate it, Lord, as it is necessary to take care of the work of God. And for it, we'll give you praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, brothers, come. Give in the offering.
Glory to God. Woo. Thank God for Jesus. Amen. If you would, while you're standing to your feet, if you would grab your Bibles and turn to Acts the ninth chapter, starting at the 32nd verse. Bible said it and it came to pass as Peter passed throughout all quarters he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda and there he found a certain man named Aeneas which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy and Peter said unto him Aeneas Jesus Christ maketh thee whole arise and make thy bed and he arose immediately and all that dwelt at Lydda and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord I want to preach to you just for a few moments from this subject Lord make me whole Lord make me whole Amen. Somebody just, somebody just look to the Lord and just say, Lord, make me whole. Lord, make me whole. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for the honor and the opportunity we have to be here this morning. We thank you for your presence that we have surely felt in this house. Oh God, we're so grateful for how you move among your people, how you help deliver, save, strengthen God. Lord, you're just such a good God. And we're so grateful. Now, Lord, we come at this moment to break the bread of your word. And I pray that you would just bless it. I pray that you would not just anoint my lips to speak, but, Lord, you would anoint our ears to hear what the Spirit would say unto the church. God, have your perfect way in this place. Let liberty go in this place, God. Let your Spirit break loose all over this house, God. That anybody that is coming here needing something from you would leave God with that need met according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. God, I thank you for what you've done. I thank you for what you're getting ready to do. Have your way in this moment, and we'll give you praise and glory and honor for it all. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. While you're on your way to your seat, just say, Lord, make me whole. Amen. It is so good to be in the house of God this morning to feel the presence of the Lord that is in this place and uh, to know that God is surely in this house helping, strengthening, and delivering. And uh, we definitely want to welcome Amber Smith with us this morning and her children with, uh, with her. We're so glad to have you all. Amen. Amen. And then we're so glad to have Shelly with us this morning. Amen. And her son with her. Amen. We're so glad to have all the saints of God in the house of God this morning and those that need the Lord, those that are in need of the Lord. Amen. We're all here. <laughs> We're all here. Amen. And God has surely met us in the worship, but now we want to hear from the word of God. And the Bible said that whatsoever thing was written aforetime was written for our learning, that through comfort and patience of the scriptures, we might have hope. This little instance here, that is recorded, just a few verses that is recorded, it may seem very small to those reading, but it was incredibly powerful to those who were experiencing it. And this was written so that we could learn something from it. This was written so we could understand something from it. And the Bible said, in all of your getting, get understanding. Because if we, we, can, have, we can have knowledge, but without understanding. Amen. There are a lot of people that can quote scripture they don't understand. There are a lot of people that quote scripture that has been quoted but still don't understand. And it is because understanding is revelation. It is knowledge that is revealed by experience. And one thing that I love about the Lord is God is a God of experience. He doesn't just write to us so that we can know how things can happen. 
He writes to us so that we can understand how they happen so that we also can be made partakers of those things. Because God doesn't just want you to know him. He wants you to experience him. His power is real saints. And it is not diminished because we are not in the first century. That's a fallacy. In fact, it's really faithlessness. The, the doctrine that is preached out there of cessation, that the gifts have ceased and that the power of God has ceased and all of these things have ceased, it is really derived from the heart and the mind of doubtful men because he said, I am God and I change not. I am the same yesterday, today, and I will be forevermore. And everything that is written within the pages of this profound book is so that we can know what God can do. So that we can understand that he still has all power. And that there is nothing that is limited to God. The only thing that limits God in my life is my ability to believe that God can do whatever he said he can do. And so it requires me to come out of a, of a mentality and a mindset of doubt, fear, bitterness. It, it requires me to come out of a situation where, where my faith is being dissolved by my past experiences. But rather my faith is being encouraged by God's present power. And I've got to get something in my spirit that says, God, if you did it then, you can do it again. If you did it before you're able to do it again if you healed before you can heal again if you delivered before you can deliver again if you saved before you can save again if you can change lives before you can change lives again and the reason why we can say this without just knowledge but a deep understanding in our heart is because we all have been made partakers of the power of God at some point in our lives now, saints of God, what we do is dependent upon what we're holding on to. As I was, uh, Sister Shonda and I were going to Knoxville uh, on Friday because Xander had a game and we were talking about different things. And I said, Sean, have you ever noticed that it doesn't matter how good life has been? People hold on to the things of bitterness. Amen. You may have experienced pain in a moment in a lifetime of goodness. But you don't hold on to the lifetime of goodness. You hold on to the moment of pain. What is it that is so corrupt in our spirit that instead of us letting go of the moment of pain and holding on to the lifetime of goodness that we would rather forget the goodness and hold on to the pain? People have done... Uh, things that have wounded and hurt us all, but people have also done things that have blessed and uplifted and strengthened us all. But we do not hold in our hearts those times of people who have blessed and uplifted and strengthened us. All we do is hold on to the times where people have wounded us. What causes us to hold on to the other while we forget the goodness? What, holds, what, what causes us to hold on to bitterness? Because whether we like it or not, we all love to be sick. We all love to be wounded. Amen. Because we're living in a carnal world. Go up to somebody and share them some good experience you've had. And they'll sit there and go, oh, that's good. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, that sounds good. Now turn around and go share with them some bad experience you had in life. And you know what happens? you all begin to commune intimately one with another. Instead of them returning and saying, let me tell you how good God's been to me, they'll sit there and just kind of pitter pat the goodness, but let them know how you've been wounded, and they will turn and tell you, well, you think you've been hurt. Let me talk you, to you about my hurt. Let me talk to you. People are willing to intimately divulge information when it comes to their wounds, but they're not willing to be so free with their blessings. And it is because... At some point in our human experience, we have found that we get the most attention when we regurgitate our wounds. We get the most attention when we sit there and rehearse the times that we have been hurt. That's really where the attention comes from. And we wouldn't hold on to them so tightly if there wasn't some type of payoff. Amen. Amen. Nobody invests in something so deeply without payoff. It's true. We get something out of it. So let's talk about Aeneas here. 
Aeneas was an adult man that at some point beyond his control had come down with palsy. It had rendered him completely paralyzed. And for eight years, he was bedridden. What an experience that changed his entire life. We don't hear much about Aeneas before his palsy. In fact, we really don't hear anything at all. All we hear is how he was sick. Come on, somebody. All we hear is how he was ill. We don't hear about anything before that. And as I was reading this, I thought, how convenient that the only time we hear about this man is when he is sick and bedridden. But things were about to change for Aeneas because he was getting ready to encounter someone that saw his future far differently than Aeneas saw it for himself. I'm sure that Aeneas thought, for eight years now I have been bound to this bed and I'm sure for the remainder of my life I will stay here. But there was somebody that had a, a hope in God and a faith in Jesus Christ and an experience to share with this man that was getting ready to change his entire future and his outlook on where he was getting ready to go. And that is what God is still doing in our lives. I'm telling you, I don't care what you come in here with, what you're bound to, how hurt you are, how wounded you are. It is not who you are. There is an outlook in this word of God that speaks better things to you than your present circumstance and condition could ever dictate. Look at somebody near you and tell them it ain't going to be always like this. It ain't going to be always like this. God sent a man by the name of Peter who also knew what it meant for God to change his outlook. Because if you remember, Jesus told them, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my father and his angels. And when Peter stood boastfully to tell Jesus that, ah, you're not going to go there alone. If I have to, I'll go die with you. But Jesus looked at him and said, I'm telling you, Simon, before the cock crows three times, or before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. And Peter did exactly what Jesus had declared he would do. And in fact, the Bible records that the final time of his denial that he turned and he looked Jesus right in his face. Oh, I can imagine that he was completely hopeless. In fact, it records that he went out grieving sorrowfully because I'm sure he thought my future is doomed now. I have denied the Lord before men. Surely he will deny me before his father and his angels. My future is over. My destiny has been determined I am a work of destruction and that will ultimately be my end but what I love about Jesus is that he is a Lord not of a second chance but he is the Lord of another chance because if it was tied to a second chance all of us have, would have been destroyed a long time ago but how many of y'all are glad that his mercy is rendered new every morning and we sit here today with grateful hearts and outstretched hands letting the Lord know we're just glad to be saved and we're so grateful that when you could have you didn't throw us away but once again brought us back into the fold oh, God. and so Jesus had resurrected and Mary, Mary and, and, and Martha had went to look for him and here these two women came. The tomb was empty. The garments were folded. And all of a sudden, she heard him, Mary. She turned. And she had heard that voice a long time. And she knew it because my sheep know my voice. But a stranger, they will not follow. In fact, they will flee from him. And he said, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended unto my father. But go tell my disciples and Peter. <laughs> Woo! 
that may might not mean a lot to you. Oh my God, Peter, can you imagine when they went up to him and said, Peter, the master's calling you to come to him. Wait a minute, I denied him. There's no way that me who had denied him three times, it wasn't one time I denied him. I denied him over and over and over again. But can you imagine the emotion that would have overcome him when they said, go get the 11 or the 10, but also go tell Peter, I want to see him too. Oh, can you imagine how his whole life changed? His whole outlook changed. My God in heaven, he knew at that moment moment I wasn't rejected of Jesus he hasn't given up on me he doesn't just want the rest of them he wants me to oh hallelujah touch somebody on the shoulder if you're near somebody and tell him he wants you to it doesn't matter how many times you've run out on him it doesn't matter how many times you've rejected him denied him cursed his name you're in here today because the Lord said go get them to I want them to I've not left them I've not forsaken them I've not abandon them and I haven't given up on them either I want them to so from that moment on Peter's life was dramatically changed the man who should have been rejected of Christ became the preacher of the day of Pentecost and became the first apostle to open up the gospel unto the Gentiles My God. his whole future had changed his whole destiny had changed and this was the same way for Aeneas. Eight years bedridden. No doctors to heal him. No hope of an alternative. He was what he was. And he now was living as a paralytic. And he would die as a paralytic. There is no hope now for me to have any help. And so no matter how productive I was before I became sick... I am now disabled and I will be disabled for the rest of my life. I have been hurt and I will now be hurt the rest of my life. I have been wounded and I will now be wounded the rest of my life. I have been broken hearted and I will now be broken hearted the rest of my life. I have been offended. I will now, come on somebody, I'm talking about you now. We moved from Aeneas and I'm talking about you because oftentimes that's how we feel. Let us get wounded in a moment of our life time and that is the bed we keep we stay right there I was abused abandoned talked about criticized ridiculed come on somebody somebody abused me that's just who I am it's the bed I have now and it's the bed I'll keep that's what's going to hold on to me and I got I, I know that God can move me forward but he's going to have to move forward a rape victim he's going to have to move forward an addict he's going to have to move forward a depressed victim an anxiety ridden man he's going to have to move forward somebody because this is the bed I have and this is the bed that I will keep but what I love about the Lord is he's not just into healing hallelujah the symptom but he's also into healing the source he can touch you and turn you around in a moment God somebody say Lord make me whole found him in a bed eight years afflicted with palsy. And Peter said, I don't believe you're going to stay there. And I come to tell somebody this morning, I don't believe you're going to stay there. I believe the Lord sought you out this morning. This is a divine appointment. The power that moved at the beginning of this service was to prepare your heart for this moment because this is the moment that's going to change your life. You're going to realize that I am not what has happened to me. I am what God says I am. And I am who God says I am. And I can do what God says I can do. And I can have what God says I can have. And I'm not talking about money because there's some people that would give a 
million dollars for a moment of peace in their mind. But I come to tell you, you don't have to pay for this thing. He did that at Calvary. And the Bible said he appointed unto them who mourn in Zion to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. All he wants you to do is call on his name. For the Bible said if you call on his name, you'll be saved. He said, call upon me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you know not of. We are often overtaken by conditions we neither wanted or asked for. Many times the things that we're suffering with can be attributed to past choices. And sometimes the things that we're suffering with, we wouldn't have asked for it if we could. We wouldn't, I mean, there's nothing we wanted of it. But now we find ourselves in the middle of it. And if we go by the world's standards, this is just the destiny of my life. This is who I'm going to be. This is now my identity. And I'm sure that everybody that walked past Aeneas that would have known him before he got the palsy probably pitied him and said, oh, poor Aeneas. Oh, I'm sorry you got sick. But look at you now. And that's the reason why you got to be careful around people that want to pity you but don't want to empower you to do anything else. Don't pity me. You can empathize with me. But don't sit there and agree with me in my condition. My God, somebody get a word out of the book and show me there's some hope for me because I can't stay like this the rest of my life. I don't like it. I don't want it. And I cannot live with it. Look at somebody and tell them, I can't live with this. I can't live with this. I can't live with depression. I can't live with anxiety. I can't live with a broken heart. I can't live with bitterness. I can't live with this wounded spirit. I can't live like this. And thank God that Aeneas found a man by the name of Peter who said, <laughs> You can't live like this. Look at somebody near you and tell them you can't live like this. You can't live like this. You can't live getting up every morning a nervous wreck. You can't live getting up every morning ready to lose your mind. You can't live like this. You can't live with poison in your spirit and a bitter root down in your heart. You can't live like this. This is not God's plan for your life. This is not the reason why God saved you, delivered you, and it's not the reason why God has preserved you. The reason why you are still alive is because the plans God has for you is far above where you're living right now so I come to tell you under the authority of the Holy Ghost you can't live like this you can't be hurt forever you can't be wounded forever you can't be bitter forever you can't be abused forever you can't be depressed forever you can't live in despair forever you can't live like this for eight years this man lived hopeless until he ran into somebody that knew there was power in Jesus Christ. Because you remember, he was wounded for my transgressions. <laughs> he was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. And by his stripes, I am healed. Hallelujah. And that healing goes deeper than the body. That healing also goes to the mind. He allowed himself to be broken so that we who were broken could be healed. He allowed himself to be wounded so that we who were wounded could be healed. He allowed himself to be bruised so we who are bruised could be healed. For you remember when he quoted out of the book of Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. For he has anointed me to preach uh, deliverance unto the captives. He has anointed me to bind up the brokenhearted and to set at liberty them that are bruised. There is anointing in Jesus Christ. In fact, the writer tells us that the yoke shall be destroyed by the anointing. And the anointing is not some feeling. The anointing is Christ himself. But that's the, what they called him. They called him Jesus Christ. Christos, the anointed one. And God sent his anointed one to destroy the yoke off your life. The yoke of sin. The yoke of 
anger, the yoke of bitterness, the yoke of depression, the yoke of grief. He did that for you. That's who he is. In eight years, this man was bedridden. No power to heal himself or to recover himself. And I'm going to tell you right now, there's sometimes you're going to find yourself in situations where no matter what you can do, you go ahead and click your heels, Dorothy, three times. You're still going to be right where you are. You can sit and find all the positive thoughts to think, all the positive statements to declare. You can sit and do all kinds of techniques trying to get yourself out of this situation. But I read in the Word, oh, hallelujah, glory to God. When Zerubbabel went in to rebuild the temple of God, my God, he saw nothing but ruins in his path. He saw it burned to the ground. Israel, Jerusalem was completely in rubble. The temple had been torn down. And I'm sure from his natural perspective, restoration seemed like an possibility but I'm glad that God has a word for every assignment that seems impossible the word of the Lord came to him and said who art thou O mountain that standeth before Zerubbabel it is not by might nor by power but by my spirit saith the Lord and I come to tell you no human effort is going to heal what you're going through no human effort is going to deliver you from what you're bound in my God it's going to take the spirit of the living God to get a hold of your life and turn you around. My God, in a situation, I can't recover myself. You ever feel that way? You ever come to the end of yourself, the end of your strength, and say, I've done everything I can, and this thing ain't getting better. I've done everything I can and this situation isn't turning around. I've done everything I can and nothing is changing. My God, I don't know what else to do. Oh, you are in prime position for God to show you what he can do because it is not till we come to the end of ourselves and start calling on the name of the Lord that we see the power of God at work in our lives. You may not have done it to yourself, but I come to tell you God can do God, he can heal to the uttermost and deliver absolutely. And so here he is. His condition had power over him. You ever feel like that? You ever feel like your mind, your spirit, your wounds, your hurts, your grief, it just takes power over you and holds you till you can't even move. You are in a paralytic condition and the bed you keep you can't even see how it could be possible for you to come up out of it. Oh, hallelujah. Don't worry, you're not alone. Aeneas was there himself. Eight years, no ability to recover. Eight years, nothing he could do to heal. Eight years, completely being overpowered by a circumstance that he did not ask for, nor did he want. Oh, hallelujah. But I love how the story doesn't end with us telling about Aeneas' condition. But oh, a man of God full of the Holy Ghost and the Word of God walks into the situation and invokes a name that is above every name. Hallelujah. He knew where the power is. And I'm going to tell you now, the power is not in your doctor's name. The power is not even in the name of New Destiny. And I can guarantee you the power is not in the name of Jared Manning. But I did read in the Word that God has given him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess of things in heaven, things in the earth and things under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father and Peter walks up to him and says Aeneas Jesus Christ hath made thee whole and I'm going to tell you today you may have walked in here thinking I'll never get rid of this but Jesus still has power to make you whole you might come in here today and say I can't be delivered of this but I come to tell you Jesus still has power to make you whole. Oh, God. I'm reminded of 10 lepers that came to Jesus desperately seeking for a healing and Jesus moved with compassion and he healed them 
from leprosy. Oh, and they all went about rejoicing. But one said, I can't leave without doing something here. You've done so much for me. Oh, that's a reason why we worship him like we worship him. It's because he's done so much for us. If you could have seen us when he found us, if you could have seen us when the Lord got a hold of us, you would you would understand why we worship like we worship. Because after you've delivered me from so much, I just can't leave you now. And the one said, oh, I can't go my way and not let him know how grateful I am. And the Bible said the one turned to give the Lord glory. And Jesus looked at him and said, your faith has made you whole. Oh, hallelujah. Because there's a difference between, between being healed and being made whole. The other ones, yes, were no longer leprous. But if his ear was gone, his ear came back. If his fingers had fallen off, his fingers returned. Whatever scars were left on him. And he still got power. I don't know how this affected Aeneas. But God didn't just heal him of his leprosy. But he made him whole. And you got to know that. You got to know that God can make you whole. God can heal you so good. You can remember it, but never ever again experience the pain of it. <laughs> but God knows the thoughts and the intents of our heart. He sees what others cannot see. And the Lord knows if I heal you today, all you'll do is go out and you'll tell everybody how good I am. But you won't turn to bring me glory. Oh, hallelujah. If you want to be made whole this morning, you can't just come to this altar and let God heal you. You're going to have to turn now and come back and let God get the glory out of your life. He didn't heal you to go back to the hell you came out of he healed you to serve him he healed you to walk before him and he healed you to be in his house that's why he healed you so he said in this listen I know you can't do nothing about this but I know a man who can <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm reminded of the woman at the well I God in heaven that woman was so riddled with sin, she wouldn't even go to the well when the rest of the women gathered because of the shame that was in her life. Oh, hallelujah. But I remember when Jesus was coming back and he looked at his disciples and he said, you go yonder and get us some food. I must needs go through Samaria. Why did you need to go through Samaria, Jesus? Because there's a little woman down there who thinks all hope is lost in her life because of the transgressions of her past. But I come to let her know, hallelujah, that behold, I make all things new. Oh, hallelujah. And he comes to the woman who obviously was, was, was absolutely saturated in shame and she had obviously given up on her life ever being restored she had had five husbands and she was living with a man now that wasn't her husband that's the reason why I can't stand the judgmental pharisaical church that people can mess up but they can't be restored the spiritual barometer of the church is not in how high we jump nor in how loud we shout but the Bible said if you see your brother overtaken in a fault you will try spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of meekness considering thyself also lest you be tempted oh I thank God for a God of restoration you might be so bitter you don't want nobody else to be restored but to hell with the devil we're going to see people restored in this place and forgiven get so bitter in your spirit you don't want nobody forgiven lest it's you you don't want nobody restored, lest it's you. You don't want nobody reconciled, lest it's you. But what about love them who have hurt you? Pray for them who persecute you. Oh, we don't want that. We don't want that because if you've hurt me by God, you've done the unpardonable sin. 
But I contend with you that ain't nobody ever sinned against you as much as you sinned against God. And God has forgiven you. So who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? I can imagine all the women. She probably didn't go up there because she knew she was being talked about. You know Sally down there? Yeah. Five times a woman's been married. Can you imagine that? Now she's just a fornicator living with a man that ain't even hers. I don't know why anybody would want to have anything to do with that. How nasty and filthy. By the way, if you're friends with her, you ain't friends with me. Get over yourself. Hallelujah. I watch people who have done horrible things to other people. Oh, but they want to be forgiven. Somebody does something to them, they can't be forgiven. And if you forgive them, you ain't my friend. Later. Bye. See ya. I ain't got time for that mess. We have not been given the ministry of damnation. We have been given the ministry of reconciliation. You go find that damnation spirit somewhere else. The Bible said that we can be reconciled back to God and restored. Amen. I ain't got time for that. There's too many people out here that think because of the sin of their past, they're, it's over. They can't, they, there's no way God give it. And I can imagine Sister Sally down at the well. I'm going to wait till everybody else in there. Because I, I I don't, want, I don't want to hear what they have to say. And she's down there. And Jesus walks up. Not only did he walk up to a woman of ill repute, but a Jew walked up to a Samaritan. <laughs> what Jesus is showing her is I can get past the stuff you've done. And I can get past the stuff you ain't got no control over. <laughs> you couldn't control being born a Samaritan, and I can get beyond that. But you did do this mess, but I can get beyond that too. Aren't you so glad that he can get beyond all that? And he said, woman, give me to drink. And she said, Lord, she said, sir, wait a minute, you're a Jew. Who, who am I? Being a Samaritan that you would ask me to drink. He said, woman, if thou knewest the gift of God and who it was said unto you, give me to drink. Oh, you would ask of him. And he said, I would give you to drink and you would never thirst again. I'm going to take that thirsty spirit out of you. <laughs> Amen. Somebody will get that later. I'm, I'm, I'm going to touch you so powerfully that this is going to change your life. And he said, go get your husband. He made her confess. She said, Lord, I don't have a husband. He said, and that you rightly said. For you have had five husbands and the one you live with now is not your husband. I'm sure at that point she thought, Yeah, so you've heard about me. But Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. If they are condemned, let them condemn themselves. But let the church preach restoration and reconciliation. It is our ministry and it is our responsibility and frankly it is our great opportunity to declare the God that has, mercy, had, has had mercy on all of us will have mercy on everyone else as well. But he so profoundly touched her life that she became the first female evangelist in the New Testament. She went down to Samaria said, come see a man. Told me all things I ever did. Is not this the Christ? And here Jesus was gathered with his disciples and others around him. And out of Samaria came a throng of people to see 
this possible Messiah. And Jesus said, say not thou that there are four months in the harvest, but lift up your heads for the fields are white under harvest. I'm telling you, he is a reconciler of all people from all places, from every condition and every situation. No matter where you find yourself right now, you may feel hopeless, but I just came this morning to give you hope that it, number one is not over for you. God has preserved you, even probably when you did not want him to. Number two, you have not gone too far that the Lord cannot take care of your situation. Number three, you've not been wounded so badly that the great physician can't do surgery this morning and heal the very place of your brokenness I serve a God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all I could ask or think according to the power that worketh in me now Peter didn't just say Jesus Christ maketh thee whole he looked at him and said and make thy What a powerful statement. Because making that bed was the acknowledgement of the end of this situation. And it was a determination that now from this moment, I will no longer be bound to this. Good God. In fact, I love what Jesus told the man who was bedridden. He said, take up thy bed. He said, the thing that's been binding you, the thing that you've been bound to, the thing that's had control over you, now you go get control of it. My God in heaven, children of God, in order for you to be made whole, you're going to have to make some commitments this morning. Number one, this is not my identity. Just because it happened to me does not mean it is who I am. Just because I did it doesn't mean that this is who I am. If any man be in Christ, he is is indeed a new creature all things are passed away and behold all things are become new Paul said it this way he said I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live but not I it is Christ that liveth in me and the life that I now live I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me so today I am making a determination just because it happened to me or just because I did it it does not mean that is who I am. In fact, I'm so fed up with being wrapped up in Jared. I'm desperately seeking Jesus because I want to be in Christ. I want to be a new creature. I want all the old stuff to pass away and I want to be something new. I'm tired of being who I am. I know that what God has for me is better than what the enemy has done to me or I have done to myself. I'm going to get up now is brighter my future is assured I know that I'm not going to be sick forever ill forever wounded forever broken forever bitter forever good God Jesus make me whole and number two I'm going to make my bed I'm going to put an end to this I'm going to put an end to this. I'm making my bed this morning. It's over. Abuse. You and I are done now. Heartbreak. We'll have no more fellowship with you. Abandonment. No thank you. Me and you will not walk together. Again. Sin. I'm not your slave. Iniquity, not my identity. I am a new creature. And if I'm not yet, before I leave this place today, I'm going to start my journey because I refuse to leave like I came. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There may be some people in here you've never made a real 
commitment to Jesus Christ and you need to do it right now because the Lord can make you whole. There are some of you that have never confessed him as the Lord of your life. But if you'll do it today, you will start a journey that you will not regret. They asked the disciples on the day of Pentecost, they said, men and brethren, what must we do? And they said, repent every one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. There are some of you in here, God wants to heal you of your past, but he's going to have to be the Lord. He's going to have to be king on the throne of your life. Others of you, you have come in here and you're holding on to history, to bitterness and brokenness, to hurt, to wounds. And no matter how much you want to go beyond that, you don't feel like there's any hope for you to transcend the situation. I'll, I'll be like this forever. But Pastor Jared, not Peter, I'm not Peter. But I am a man that believes God. I came to tell you this morning that Jesus Christ makes you whole. All you have to do is come and say, I'm making my bed. I'm moving on now. That era of who I am is over. That was a moment in my life. Now I am determined by the help of God to move forward and to be what he needs me to be. And I am making a commitment that as he heals me and makes me whole, that I will surrender my life a living sacrifice to him, holy and acceptable unto the Lord. And I will serve him the rest of my life and allow him to get the glory. If you're in this place, that's the whole point. If you're watching my life, the whole point of the work of Jesus Christ was reconciliation to the Father. That's the whole reason. So that we could be made like him. So that God could begin the work in our life that he is intended to do from the foundation of the world. If you're in this place, I want us to stand all over, over this place. If you're in this place, I want you to make your bed this morning. Just because you're leaving a moment doesn't mean you're abandoning those you love. It just means that I can't live like this. God, you've kept me alive. I didn't die when they died. I didn't run away when they ran away. You kept me. And I want to be made whole. And I want to serve you the rest of my life. And I will commit my way to Christ. I want to be a child of God. And if you're in this place and that's your desire, I'm going to pray for you. And I want you to know that this is not a place, this is not a pharisaical church. We preach the truth around here. But we preach the truth only so that you can be reconciled back to God through Jesus Christ. So that you can find that this life is joy unspeakable, full of glory. That you don't have to live depressed and angry and bitter and broken. You don't have to live grieving and sorrowful. In fact, he said, I will take your tears and you'll reap the harvest of joy. Your mourning, I'll turn that to dancing. How is that possible? With man, nothing is, is possible. With God, all things, all things, all things. You'd be surprised. You'll wake up tomorrow with a smile in your, on your face and a song in your heart. Because it is the joy of the Lord that is our strength. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, there's some people that need to be made whole this morning. There's some people in here, God, need to make their bed that need to put to an end, God, a season of their life. And they need to allow you, Lord, to cause them to raise up now and to move forward into the glorious future that you have planned for them. 
Father, in the name of Jesus, whether it's something that has been done to them beyond their control or things they have done to themselves, what I love about the Word of God is it proves to us, Lord, that there is nothing that you cannot get through. There is no wall that you cannot tear down. There's no yoke you can't destroy. There's no past you can't redeem, God. You are able to do more than we can ask or think. So for that soul or those souls this morning, that either need to come and surrender their life to you or for that person that needs to make their bed. Served you faithfully, Lord, was fired up, loved walking before you, but was wounded. And now they find themselves in the bed of discouragement, bitterness, and despair. Make them whole this morning and help them to make their bed and move on with you and serve you faithfully from this point moving forward. Oh God, redeem, restore, reconcile, God, heal. Do what only you can do, Lord. There's no power of man that can take care of this, but you are the great physician. Go to work this morning and heal, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. If you're in this place this morning and you've never, ever committed your life to Christ, ever, this altar is open if you're in this place this morning and you're backslidden Christ said to go get you too to go get you too this altar is open if you've been wounded and hurt and you need God to heal you so that you're not holding on to bitterness but you're moving forward with joy and peace in your life this altar is open this is not saints of God a country club for the morally obligated. This is the hospital in which the great physician divinely does the surgery necessary to heal those who have been broken. If you're in this place and you need that, we have people here that will pray for you. I will pray with you. But this altar is open. As they sing, make your way down here. Don't even hesitate. Don't worry about what people are going to think about you. Amen. We've all come to the well. We all need the Lord. Surrender that to Christ. Surrender that to Christ. Put it on the altar. Then make your bed and leave it there. Oh, he's a God that he is.
this morning, make a commitment in your heart. Lord, I'm not spending the rest of my life with this being my identity. I'm surrendering this stuff to you. Your plans for me are too powerful for me to let stuff that is beneath you stop me. Realizing that, God, I will be what you called me to be. I will do what you called me to do. And I will receive what you are giving to me. And none of this stuff in my history will I ever permit again to stop me from reaching to my destiny. I'm making my bed. It's over. I'm moving forward with joy. I'm moving forward with peace. And I am moving forward with pure confidence in the God of my salvation. Hallelujah. David said, I was young and now I'm old. And he said, I've never seen a child of God begging bread. I was young and now I'm old. 
And I've never found peace like I have in my life right now. Oh, I fought it a long time. I didn't want to give in. I wanted to do my way, my thing. And one day I woke up and I thought, my Lord, what am I doing? I'm killing myself so I can do it my way. How pitiful is that? And now, every night when Nancy and I share the word together and we have prayer, I had to say the other night, Lord, I'll bet you're just bored stiff with my prayers. I don't need anything. I don't want anything. I am at peace with myself and with the world. And if you're not, be honest first of all and admit it. But then don't sit and say, well, that's the way it is. Because that's not the way it is. You can have that same peace, that same attitude. Oh, yeah, I have upsets in my life. I have things that don't go my way. But that's not important anymore because I've won the battle. I have won the battle, and you have too. Sometimes I wonder when I see the same names over and over on our prayer list. And I wonder, Lord, why? Why haven't they been healed? Or why haven't they gone beyond the point? And then I have to be honest. Well, Joe, it took you a long time to get past there because you kind of enjoyed where you were. You kind of enjoyed people saying, Oh, how are you feeling? Oh, how's the world treating you? A buddy of mine asked me how the world was treating me one time, and I said, about as well as I deserve. And he said, oh, my God, it's not that bad, is it? <laughs> but sometimes we have to participate in ways that we don't want to. Sometimes I have to simply say, no, Lord, I'm just going to trust you. I'm not going to be who I was. I'm going to be who you call me to be. I'm not going to be the man I used to be. I'm going to be the man you've made me to be. I'm not going to allow this problem to become a real problem. Because sometimes I need to call on someone else to help strengthen me. That's why we have the church. That's why we're all together is to help strengthen one another. Announcements. Happy birthday to Caitlin Chapman and Greg Harris. We'll have to sing happy birthday to them. How about that? Come on up here. Come on. Come on. It's one of the punishments for being part of the family. All right, somebody get Sister Kaylin. She's probably watching. Tell her, come on out. She probably has. She's like, hide underneath the chair. Nobody will notice. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. <laughs> Amen. We love God's people, and we're glad for every year God gives them. Amen. And so we're going to sing happy birthday to him, all right? You ready? One, two, three. Happy birthday to you and you. Happy birthday to you and you. Happy birthday, dear Caitlin and Greg. Happy birthday to you and you. Oh, happy birthday to you. Oh, happy birthday to you. May you find Jesus near. Every day of the year, oh, happy birthday to you, oh, happy birthday to you, and the best one you've ever had. <laughs> happy birthday. Hallelujah. Okay, family fun night, January 27th. Pick a country, it says, international food. 
That doesn't mean everybody makes chili that night, okay? International is more than the U.S. and Mexico. <laughs> Women's prayer, February 21st at 6.30. We do have prayer requests. Lucas Loveless, Shonda Crawford still needs to have some healing in her body. Braden Manning, that's Brother Jeremy's son. We need to continue to pray for the Burr family and their baby Whitten. David Peters has cancer. Denny Livingston has cancer. And we need to pray for Brother Calvin. Let me make a suggestion to some of you who are fighting chronic health problems. Those are real. I've got them myself. I fight them all the time. But one thing I'd like for you to do, get yourself an accountability partner. Find somebody within this congregation that you trust to be a, an honest person and unite with them in prayer for your situation. There is so much more power. One can turn away a thousand, two, ten thousand. One can hold the problem down a little while. Two can get rid of it. Make yourself available to be that accountability partner for someone. Pray about it. Trust God. I, Brother Calvin and I went to a doctor's office. and I was sitting there waiting for him, and I thought to myself, this place is nothing but a cesspool. All these people sneezing and snotting and puking and carrying on. And two days later, I go to see him, and we're both doing it. And I said, that's your fault. Don't you do that to me again. But we need to support each other, and we need to do it sincerely. Oh, thank God for healing. Thank God for the presence of the Spirit that causes us not to allow these little things to overcome us, but get stronger in that. Trust Him more. Get somebody else that trusts Him. Call each other up. Pray on the telephone. Be there for somebody. Praise God. Father, this has been a wonderful day. Thank you for this message of encouragement and strength, this message that gives us a desire to serve you more every day of our life. And Father, just because we get sick or we get old or we get mad or we get our feelings hurt, that's no excuse. Lord, we need to serve you with all that we have in us. We need to pray for one another. And Lord, we need to thank you constantly for the great things you've done for us in our lives. In Jesus' name, until we come together again, may your Holy Spirit guide, direct, and touch each life. Keep us, Lord. Take care of us. And we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.